Welcome everybody. <laughs> Today we have a special Grand Rounds who's going to be introduced by our Doug Zatzik. So, Doug, take it away. It's my great pleasure to introduce Paula Schnur, who has been a colleague in the PTSD world for, gosh, oh, at least a decade, too, probably days. Resident, of, I, think. I think I was a resident. So Paula is really incredibly prolific. She's currently acting executive director at the National Center for PTSD in, um, she lives in New Hampshire, but it's in Vermont, at Dartmouth. And um, she, she's just, you know, A, she's published in incredible journals like JAMA, you know, a classic CBT trial showing that CBT can actually work for military and veteran patient populations. But then you find her at the most remarkable places. I ran into her at the implementation science meeting, the NIH meeting, incredibly competitive to get abstracts in. And she's doing a VA PTSD dissemination presentation. Uh, or y y she's just remarkably productive and in the PTSD cognitive behavioral therapy world one of the most open-minded individuals I can imagine with regard to um, sort of uh, health services and implementation science. So without any further introduction, we'll hear from Paula. Doug, thank you. That's a very nice, uh, very nice uh, introduction. I, I probably have a lot of people to thank, but I especially want to uh, thank John Fortney, uh, my collaborator. Uh, I was very glad to be a part of his top trial, which I want to mention. Um, but, but essentially, John is responsible for helping uh, to get me here. And so uh, I know it's, uh, it's the middle of the day, and I want to make sure I stay on time for questions, because my preference is actually to have questions throughout a talk. I always say, if I could sit through lectures, I would have been able to go to medical school. And uh, I actually can't, but I understand the format is such that we have to have a talk and then some questions. So I want to talk about the state of the evidence in psychotherapy research, but to do that, I'm going to start with a little bit of review of methodology and um, then talk about the evidence on treatment. I'll, I'll share with you the VA DOD practice guideline as an example of guidelines, and then uh, spend maybe half of my time talking about what's new and what our future directions are. Now, when I um, gave a version of this talk at Dartmouth in a Grand Rounds, my chair, Alan Green, do any people know Alan Green? Well, he came up to me and he said, Paula, that's so nice that you do this research when you can't control anything. <laughs> and, I, and I think that's a, a, a little bit of the idea about psychotherapy research, but in fact, there are ways to control things, it's just that you have to take charge. Uh, in in um, placebo-controlled drug research, a lot of the quality control is done at a factory, and it is done by the PI and the staff in a psychotherapy trial. So let me just talk a little bit about that, and then we'll jump into data. So if you think about the characteristics of psychotherapy and drug interventions, um, psychotherapy has more of the following. I can't say that it's unique, however, because many of the issues also happen in placebo-controlled drug trials. They're just less uh, important. First of all, the treatment involves collaboration between participants and providers. True, you gotta get a patient to take a pill, but it's actually that collaboration, it's that dynamic interaction that is the treatment for I in a psychotherapy uh, study. Uh, blinding patients and providers is virtually impossible. I go crazy when reviewers get worked up that there isn't blinding in a psychotherapy study. Why would a therapist not want to know what treatment they're delivering? Why would a patient not want to know what they're getting? It's completely crazy. The standard methodology instead is to use blinded assessment because it's not just not feasible, it's not desirable to do in a psychotherapy study. Now, provider expertise can influence the results in any study, but especially because, because each time, each session, each patient, the, the therapist is doing the treatment over and over, better therapists uh, will get uh, likely uh, better outcomes. Um, the, therefore, you have to assess uh, the provider adherence uh, and in, in ways that are um, different from the assessment, say, of a um, following a drug protocol, many, many drug studies do have manualized protocols for dosing and managing side effects. 
but typically you wind up with video and audio taping and expert scoring. It's a much more labor intensive uh, procedure. And then the, the very significant thing that I want to talk about today are the control conditions. We don't have placebos in psychotherapy research. The control conditions often have active elements. And, and if you're going to pay attention to one part of the talk, what I want to say about control conditions is very helpful for understanding this literature. So some of the, the broad issues, if, if we were doing a workshop on how do you do psychotherapy research, we'd be talking not only about control conditions, but how you equate the control condition to the active condition in terms of session length and who does it and whether you have homework, how therapists get assigned to conditions, the use of manuals, how you train, supervise people and uh, do fidelity monitoring, <coughs> what kinds of additional treatment people can have. In most psychotherapy studies, people are allowed to ha have a fair amount of additional treatment, especially medication, and then group-based treatments also have their own unique issues. So I think this is what Alan Green, my chair, thinks psychotherapy research is. Personally, I would rather be in that out-of-control group. It looks like a lot more fun. <laughs> So the, the different types of control groups we have are used to address different questions. And that is what is critically important to understand when you are reading a study, what can you infer from the study? So at, at our very most basic design, we use, a, here I'm talking about randomized designs, we use a wait list. People are randomized to not get treatment or, or to, to get treatment or to wait. Most of the time, waitlist participants can have a fair amount of treatment like medication, self-help, uh, and, and so on. This is a great design because with randomization, you control for all kinds of threats to internal validity like selection and maturation, history, regression to the mean, but it only tells you whether the treatment has benefit whether the change you see in patients is due to treatment, and that's the only thing it tells you. This is for efficacy studies, not effectiveness studies, so establishing, like the first few studies done, maybe the first one or two, this is a good design. But after that, it's really important to ask a, a, a more refined question, is the effect of this treatment more than you get from just having good therapy? Is there anything special? about ACT or present-centered therapy, or is there anything special about cognitive processing therapy? And we do that with a non-specific comparison treatment, like supportive counseling or present-centered therapy, or just usual care. Now, sometimes that's all you need to do. Basically, you've established the treatment works, and it's better than just getting some good therapy. But sometimes it's important to do what are called con component control studies. Can you take the components of the treatment apart? or you excuse me, can you uh, combine them? For example, do you add cognitive restructuring to exposure to make a better treatment because they're both effective strategies? And then uh, lastly, we also do active-active comparisons, psychotherapy versus medication, prolonged exposure versus um, uh, cognitive processing therapy. These are studies that we do when it makes sense to do them to find out is something better or more cost-effective and, and so on. So let me back up a minute, which I'm not able to do. But escape. okay. Escape and then left arrow. Okay. So here we're talking about the importance of comparison groups in terms of influencing the question the study is addressing. What are you controlling for? But it also makes a difference because it influences the actual effect size. There was a lot of fuss just to do that. Now look, I want to go back to the slide. And now it's not going back. Ah, I'm here. So the more active the comparison treatment, the smaller the effect you're going to see. And this is why it's really important to know when you're saying, oh, the effect in this study was a D of 1.0, the effect in this study was only 0.5. Well, maybe the comparison treatment was more active in the second study. So you always need to know what was the comparator. Here on this slide, I'm showing you for eye movement desensitization and reprocessing trials that had been done for the ISTSS 2000 
uh, practice guideline. There's, sen there's been a revision uh, more recently. But in essence, I've just ordered the slide, the, the studies here from largest to smallest uh, effect sizes. And the blue are the studies that had a weightless control. And the red are the studies that had some kind of active but nonspecific control. And you can see the effect sizes are larger. I didn't make this up. And believe it or not, I didn't go around looking for different uh, bodies of literature to do this. This was the first one I looked at. It was so <laughs> great, I quit while I was ahead. <laughs> okay, But other people have, will report the, the same thing. It's just logic. You're controlling for more things. You're taking progressive bites out of the effect size with more active uh, comparators. Now, the aqua studies here in eye movement to sensitization and reprocessing, there's some theoretical um, it, uh, concern about whether eye movements are necessary, whether they are the active ingredient. So they've done studies where they have participants fix their eyes or move their eyes according to the protocol, and that's what these particular studies are. And I think the jury's still out on that, by the way. So, okay, that, that's the um, all I wanted to say for now about psychotherapy methodology. Uh, this slide essentially summarizes what we know about the treatment of PTSD. It's a meta-analysis I did with my colleague Vince Watts at the White River Junction VA. And what we know is that some types of medication, psychotherapy, and somatic treatments are effective. In this meta-analysis, are you going to be able to, if I use my, are you seeing? Okay. So we had, we had a very progressively uh, refined uh, hierarchical chart. This is the first two levels of the chart where we first broke things into medication, somatic treatment, and psychotherapy. And then these are the first line, the second line categories uh, within that. So medication has a, a significant effect of about 0.42, which is uh, close to a medium effect compared to placebo. And it's really the antidepressants and uh, atypical uh, antipsychotics. I'm not showing on the slide, but may I tell you, it's not all antidepressants. It's the SSRIs except um, citalopram and also venlafaxine that seem to be effective. Uh, in our study, it was the only risperidone. Um, other studies suggest that topiramate may have some benefit as well. And I'm not a medication expert. I'm just trying to help you understand that even these categories are, are larger than the, the actual uh, use that you might, if you were trying to implement this in practice. For the somatic treatments, we had RTMS, repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation and acupuncture. And it was only the acupuncture that was positive. There's a new acupuncture trial out as well. And so that actually may have some promise. Our guidelines may have to get revised in the, the coming years. RTMS is still um, not established. Some data are suggesting that it may have benefits, but there's a lot of concerns about exactly how you do the RTMS that may affect the efficacy. In psychotherapy, it's cognitive behavioral therapy, EMDR, group therapy, and then a few other single therapies, like one study long ago found that hypnotherapy was effective. Uh, I don't put much stock in old, old studies of, of that sort that haven't been replicated. But essentially, our toolbox is CBT, EMDR, and uh, some types of group therapy. Now, I, because I'm focusing on psychotherapy, I wanted to share with you the findings in that category. And essentially, the effect sizes for individual uh, psychotherapy do not uh, differ in terms of the, uh, in, in terms of EMDR and the, the CBTs. Uh, with one exception, uh, cognitive processing therapy was, has a, a larger effect than other uh, types of exposure therapy. Some people have done exposure only in vivo, only imaginal, and, and, and so on. But the effects that we see generally, uh, and I'm, I'm going to accept the desensitization study, we're generally seeing a 1 to about a 1.5 or 1.6 effect size. This is a between groups effect size. Now, this is not stratified by type of comparison group. And some of these, uh, some of these categories are more likely to have certain types of groups than others. But essentially, I believe this is true. Right now, the takeaway for you is that we don't have strong evidence that one type of effective psychotherapy is more effective than another type of effective psychotherapy. And, and, and just foreshadowing perhaps questions, patient preference really has to guide the selection of therapies for now. 
Now, in presenting these data, I've had hands go up many times saying, well, the psychotherapy looks better than medication because you all use those weightless designs and those are ridiculous. They don't control for attention. And so uh, the best way to answer that kind of comment is with data. And so what Vince and I did is break down our effect sizes, not just in terms of psychotherapy and medication, but here what you're seeing uh, in the top bar, this is the effect size for weightless control designs. This is the, weight the, the effect size for active control designs, and this is the medication effect size, okay? So I'm putting my money where my mouth is. And essentially what you can see is, yes, psychotherapy weightless control studies are much larger than, than or have an effect size much larger than medication placebo control. But the active control psychotherapy studies, where some of these people are getting a lot of very active but nonspecific treatment, they're still better than medication. I'm not against medication, okay? I'm, I'm really not. I'm just saying that with the data we have on hand, with the treatments that we have, we get way more bang for our buck with psychotherapy right now. And if you're a budding medication researcher, it's actually a good place to be if you have good ideas because the field desperately needs to be, I, I think, essentially looking at novel mechanisms because the, what the antidepressants are targeting uh, is, is just not, I'm glad to see heads nodding. It's just probably not the right place to go. So we have a variety of effective <coughs> therapies and we have a variety of practice guidelines. You can, you can find one that you like. Essentially, especially with respect to psychotherapy, um, they all pretty much say the same thing. CBT, EMDR, stress inoculation. Okay, th th those, there's good consensus. Uh, there's a little bit more variability in what they have to say about medication again. But by and large, what's nice is that these, these have been established by bodies around the world. Different people with different criteria still come to the same conclusion. The Institute of Medicine uh, report did not, however, that, that was a very rigorous review. It's not meant to be a guideline, although it has been used that way. Uh, they, they took a, and essentially threw out all of the medication studies for consideration as having high risk of bias. And so that conclusion was that only exposure therapy, which included cognitive processing, they said that was the only treatment that had sufficient evidence. I think we think there's more than that. This is what the guideline looks like. There, it's part of a set of guidelines, and they all look very official government-like. Those of us in VA recognize things like this. And this is the guideline for psychotherapy. Uh, the, the recommended, you want to be A-level. Uh, essentially, you want to try that as your frontline treatment because that's where there's <coughs> substantial benefit and the balance uh, of benefit versus harm is large. These are trauma-focused psychotherapies that include uh, components of exposure and uh, cognitive restructuring or stress inoculation training, and here they include EMDR. So this is what the VA and Department of Defense recommend. Level C are studies for which the benefit of harm, or the, the, the cost-benefit ratio essentially is unclear. And uh, psychoeducation, which I think we all believe in, probably we all do, um, doesn't have an evidence base, but it's still probably good to do. Uh, imagery rehearsal therapy, which is a way of rescripting uh, nightmares, has uh, mixed evidence and probably the best study found absolutely no benefit of it. Psychodynamic uh, therapy and hypnosis, there's one study each on those, an old study. Uh, relaxation is often a comparison condition. I personally think relaxation is good, but again, not as a primary treatment. And group therapy, I'm going to dig into group therapy because there's a lot to be said there. Uh, insufficient evidence on family therapy, there's a little more now, but uh, family therapy and couples therapy are still very much emerging and we're not sure for whom we use them and how to best use them, what are the best models, but I happen to have one I'm going to show you that I think is pretty good. And then it's not known about web-based CBT. Since this was done, there's one trial published suggesting it can be effective, I'll show you. Dialectical behavior therapy, I think there's some new data suggesting it may have benefit for PTSD. And acceptance and commitment therapy, and I'll show you one of my studies actually on ACT. It's, it's not published, but I can show you data. 
So I want to talk about group therapy because group therapy isn't a type of therapy, it's a modality. And you can have process groups, you can have psychodynamic groups, you can have anger management, cognitive processing therapy. So it's really important to understand that when we're talking about group therapy, we're talking about a heterogeneous set of uh, interventions that share the group format. Denise Sloan published a very nice meta-analysis a few years ago, and here's what she found. The pre-post change had an effect size, this is just before to after, after treatment, uncontrolled, of 0.69, which is medium to large. This is, uh, this is smaller than we typically see in individual therapy. So it looks like the way you move the needle overall in group therapy is smaller on average for individuals. Um, it's effective compared to wait list, and that's important. So group therapy works. Even when you mush all the types of therapy together, it works. Uh, but it doesn't seem to matter, <coughs> at least in this analysis, what type of group therapy is being used. Typically, the, the studies that have compared, have done this kind of comparison, have compared cognitive behavioral group of some sort with some kind of nonspecific or presence-centered group. And, there, and there, at least at the time she did this, there didn't seem to be any evidence that the cognitive behavioral, which I think many people would think would be better, was actually better. But there's a few caveats to understanding this uh, literature. No, first of all, no studies have directly done that head-to-head -head group versus individual. I think Patty Riesick is un has a study right now uh, where she's comparing for uh, cognitive processing therapy, which is which is very helpful. Um, and, and, and Denise Sloan did not include some recent findings on cognitive processing therapy, which are suggesting that the group format is effective and much more effective. I think it can be a game changer for group therapy. Um, there's also analytic problems with the current evidence that we have that probably optimistically bias what we know. Um, in a group, think of what happens in a group. You're trying to get the people to influence one another. And if you've gone through Statistics 101, you're trying to ha make sure your observations are independent of one another, okay, cross purposes. And so you need to take this into account and, and analyze data as if this clustering is occurring. It's also the case that the N in a, in a clustered design is the number of clusters or groups, not the number of subjects, okay? And if you don't do this, all of this variance that's due to groupiness Gets, gets added to the treatment effect and it boosts the treatment effect. Now, Denise Sloan did do this correction in her meta-analysis, but, but when you read most of the literature, the only two of the studies in her meta-analysis had done this originally. So let me show you why this is so uh, profound. And now you're going to think I'm off medications and now I'm on a tear against group therapy. But um, using the correct analysis reduces the observed effectiveness. Baldwin and colleagues took studies that were on the American Psychological Association's list of evidence-based group therapies. You got on the list by being a, a well-done study that had significant results. So 100% of the studies are <coughs> significant or 100% of the treatments have significant findings. Well, the first thing they did uh, in this study is say, okay, let's just fix that problem with the ends. We'll correct the degrees of freedom from being about the subjects to being about the number of groups, and one-third of the treatments fell off the list. So one-third of the treatments would no longer be recommended by the APA if, you, if that simple assumption, uh, the simple correction had been made. Then uh, Baldwin and colleagues adjusted for the correlation among the participants, just are hypothetically saying, okay, if it's 0 0.05 as, as an intra-class correlation, which is how you measure this group effect, so what, what would happen? Another third fell off. And so I personally think that about a 0 0.05, especially for manualized treatment, is what you will typically see. So even if you don't like statistics, here's a, here's a takeaway. Without doing the statistical analysis correctly, somewhere between one third and two thirds of the studies that report significant findings uh, do not have significant findings. That's what we know. And so we really need a rethink uh, on what we know about group therapy in order to better understand how to use groups. Because I don't know, in VA, we love groups. We probably still half of our treatment is group therapy, and it's really important for us to know how to, do, how to use the most effective treatments or whether to be using the group format. Yes, there's a question. It, um, can you say anything about the types of groups that, that stayed uh, significant? The, the question is about the types of groups that stayed significant, and um, I don't recall that they reported that. 
Uh, one possibility is that they were larger studies <coughs> in the first place, uh, which also tend to, you know, give you more reliable uh, results. But I, I don't believe Baldwin ever reported that. Now, this gives me great hope. The fact that you can answer a question and I can ask it means anybody can ask a question, at least in the room, while I'm talking. Okay. <coughs> so now I want to move into current topics in psychotherapy research. And this is my way of trying to organize things for you so that you're not just drinking from this big fire hose of studies and that you can think about essentially four big questions that I think we're working on. In psychotherapy, the, the, right now we are not so focused on developing new treatments because we have a number of treatments and they're effective. Instead, we're focused on the following. First of all, how do we maximize effectiveness and efficiency? They work, but how do we make them work better? How do we make them work for more uh, people using altered format, um, medication to enhance exposure therapy, transdiagnostic treatment uh, to uh, maximize the, the, the kind of treatments that we uh, can offer. And let me start here with a, a lovely study by Anka Ehlers in the United Kingdom. She's developed a cognitive therapy that really works. It's great. We don't do it so much in this country. We tend to do cognitive processing therapy. But this is a great treatment, except it's 12 hourly sessions. And uh, Anka has been working on ways to compress the schedule for this treatment. Uh, Edna Fo has been working on this, too, with exposure therapy. But what she did, her treatment is 12 one-hour sessions. She gave the treatment in multiple hours per day for one week. Uh, versus the standard format, the 12 weekly sessions. And uh, she also had an emotion-focused, non-specific comparison treatment and a wait list. And so uh, the, uh, the um, intensive therapy is the blue line. And I think, l l actually, let me start with the wait list, because that basically shows you what happened over time. Wasn't much change in PTSD severity. Uh, when uh, the emotion-focused therapy, the, the non uh, the non or the non-specific but supportive treatment, did pretty well. People improved. That's a meaningful <coughs> improvement. But what the blue and the red track one another very closely, and that's standard format versus the intensive format. So this is huge. Imagine you could in one week. If a patient had the time, in one week you could help the patient make very substantial gains. 35 on this scale means very severe PTSD. 10 on this scale basically means recovered. Okay? Now this would not, VA patients tend to be more complicated. I don't know about your patient population. We probably would have more modest results. Might have to do a little bit more. But this is so significant. It just changes. Imagine your scheduler is trying to handle this. I, you know, I, in the VA, this would be impossible with our scheduling system. But it's, but it's really important because it, it can help a patient get better so fast. I, I would predict this would also promote engagement and reduce dropout because you're noticing gains day to day. It's like those diets in the back of a magazine where you lose you know, 14 pounds in one week, right? This is sort of like losing 14 points or 14 symptoms in the span of a week. And I don't mean to trivialize that because I think this has real potential. It's a way to get more people engaged in psychotherapy and get them better. Now, I mentioned uh, the use of drugs to enhance exposure therapy. Uh, there's there's other studies. I think um, John, some, did someone just, I, mean, I think it was John Fortney, but maybe I'm mistaking this. I just saw a study on using um, sertraline to enhance seeking safety. Not you, okay. Um, that's, I don't have that slide, but it looks like sertraline can potentiate or it, it, uh, seeking safety. But there's been interest in a, a drug called decycloserine, uh, which is a partial NMDA receptor uh, agonist. I think it's used for tuber tuberculosis as a treatment, but it has this uh, side effect that it can benefit, ex enhance extinction learning in animal models and in some anxiety disorders. So this sounds great. Instead of the 10 to 12 exposure sessions, maybe we can boost <coughs> the, the benefit of each exposure session and get it done faster. First study didn't find that. Uh, it was done in the, in Holland, found maybe it, it, it was uh, effective in people who were more severe, but overall it was a null trial. Brett Litz actually found that compared to placebo where people improved because they were getting exposure therapy and that works, the people who got decycloserine actually got worse. 
And what they found um, I is that habituation seemed to be impaired. The, the subjective units of distress, the suds, were not decreasing as they're supposed to. So I kind of think maybe DCS, th they're s suggesting that uh, the DCS caused the trauma memories to be reconsolidated more intensely. It could be just like the kind of dosing you would do to get habituation versus sensitization in a learning paradigm. And maybe you just have to hit the right window with DCS in order to not get harm. But I don't think you're going to get benefit. Let me show you this uh, other slide. This is from uh, Barbara Rothbaum in a trial of virtual reality exposure, uh, where people are doing exposure therapy uh, immersed with technology in a virtual environment. These are uh, OEF, OIF veterans from <coughs> Iraq and Afghanistan. And she randomized, everyone got exposure, but she randomized people to get DCS, that's the blue line, alprazolam, which is an interesting drug and unfortunately uh, too popular in many PTSD patients versus placebo. And so the placebo is essentially your marker of how is the exposure <coughs> therapy working. So uh, from before treatment to after treatment, what she found is no benefit of decycloserine. <coughs> Another null trial. The alprazolam actually worsened the effects somewhat. And what's interesting is that if sh she looked at reactivity and she looked at cortisol levels, it looks like DCS was behaving as it's supposed to, that it was facilitating extinction, but that wasn't translating into people getting better. And so the big takeaway here, I think, is not the DCS story. I just did want to point out that um, benzodiazepines are not recommended for PTSD. And in the VA, about, I think, about, unfortunately, about 30% of our patients are on primarily chronic regimens of, of benzos, and um, it's very hard to get them off, and we don't think that's a, a very good idea. Acceptance and commitment therapy is a transdiagnostic uh, treatment that we thought had great benefit, because you know patients come in and they don't say, I have PTSD. They don't know the ICD or the DSM codes. They have a, a range of symptoms. They experience them holistically. And so a transdiagnostic treatment, which treats all of the problems together, may be ideal because that means you don't have to go through this treatment for your PTSD and that <coughs> treatment for your panic disorder and, and, and so on. An effective treatment for uh, depression and some anxiety disorders. So Ariel Lang, uh, who, who was the, the uh, primary PI and the co-PI, uh, and I ran a study, uh, including Seattle as a site, um, with 160 male and female uh, veterans uh, who got ACT or present center therapy, which is a very active, nonspecific treatment that focuses on PTSD in the here and now ha and, and current life problems and uh, problem solving around those problems. And what we found, it, everybody is really hoping this trial would be um, positive because people love ACT and they want to show that it worked. But we found some modest improvement over time but no, no benefit of ACT. And what we even found in further analyses is that the people across both treatments, the people with PTSD, did worse than the people without PTSD. Because it's transdiagnostic, not everyone had to have PTSD. And so right now, we may need <coughs> something that is less transdiagnostic. And if we're doing ACT, it may need to be more PTSD and trauma-focused, <coughs> the opposite of what we were hoping. So another question for us is how we enhance access and engagement, for example, using telehealth or alternate treatment settings. Um, we, we can do a video teleconferencing to deliver psychotherapy effectively. Uh, Leslie Moreland's uh, study here showed that the video conferencing, if anything, was a little better than in-person therapy. That's the orange line for uh, delivering anger management. Alliance is usually good in these studies. It, it can be done now, and it's been, it's been done over and over. We're now studying in-home care as the next frontier. Self-help is promising, but the evidence is still emerging. Yes. Is that in home meaning you go there? Or no, meaning you stay where in a, you can stay in your home, and the patient can stay in his or her home, and you you've got uh, the patient has a tablet probably or is interacting the way I'm interacting with the remote sites now, and so th that has great potential for reducing barriers because patients don't even have to go to a care facility. We're do we started doing this in Hawaii, which is one of the most rural states after Alaska. Uh, where the therapists literally were flying island to island at times to deliver care. So you can, you can do this safely, prolonged exposure, cognitive processing. Self-help, a lot of people are thinking it's, it's just going to get more technological, the way we deliver care. 
more of the self-help um, treatments that seem to work involve some therapist facilitation, but it's a good question. Can you just put it out there on the internet? Can people just be engaged by themselves with, without that help? This study by uh, Debbie Brief and Terry Keene suggests possibly, this is called VET change, it's a self-management um, for risky drinking and <coughs> PTSD. The one caveat is that this and other self-help studies typically pay participants to engage in each session. So you get money each time you go back in. And I don't think I would be motivated to do self-help. I think I would need external supports. But it may be an option for some patients. You can even do telehealth by telephone when all else fails. Probably many of you have tried to have done uh, therapy over the phone when your patient couldn't get in and you had to talk to them. Uh, in this study, Barbara Niles showed it, it, it was an effective strategy for delivering uh, mindfulness. Now, um, a little promotion. Some of the best work has been just happening in Seattle. Um, this is a study that John Fortney led. Um, to show that telehealth can help patients gain access to effective treatment. It's not merely to deliver the treatment as in Leslie Moreland's work, but in this study, John um, led a group to do a, a collaborative care intervention that involved telehealth at, at CBOX, the community-based outpatient clinics, to help patients get access to cognitive processing therapy. Now, I had previously done a, a study without the telehealth piece, but a very similar study using collaborative care uh, to enhance uh, primary care and found no benefit. People got more treatment, they got more evidence-based treatment, and they didn't get more better uh, because they were getting <coughs> more care that wasn't effective care. Here, the, the intervention was actually mediated by getting an, a, an adequate dose of cognitive processing therapy. So this, this is very consistent with what we've been learning, but it's also a, maybe needs about a 90-degree turn or maybe a 180-degree turn to think that we can't just bring people to pair, care, we have to bring them to effective care. Research on psychotherapy for PTSD in primary care is still emerging. It's important because, as you know, many patients prefer to have their care in primary care. And it's effective for managing depression and other anxiety disorders. The kind of psychotherapies that work for PTSD um, are a problem, though, because in a primary care setting, we typically have the constraint of needing to do fewer and briefer sessions. We don't get 10 one-hour sessions with a primary care patient. There are briefer interventions. No, no randomized trials have been published, but um, the initial pilot findings are encouraging that we may have ways to do this in maybe four to six half-hour sessions, which would be very significant. And lastly, another Seattle um, collaborative study, cognitive processing therapy can be also uh, done in uh, low-resource environments. This was a study uh, led by Bass at Johns Hopkins, but involving Deb Kaysen here, where they showed that cognitive processing therapy was effective for treating uh, patients who were in 16 villages in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where the literacy was a giant issue, where the therapists were actually what were called psychosocial support assistants uh, who had case management background and uh, about four years of post-primary school education. So this actually tells us that we have broad potential for di dissemination in formats that we never would think. <coughs> this is far from the psychiatrist's couch in Manhattan or in Seattle. Uh, th this, is, this is a very different environment. We, it, we really are learning just the boundaries or the lack thereof in how we can deliver effective care. Comparative effectiveness is my particular interest, how treatments such as prolonged exposure and cognitive processing uh, therapy compare, and what works for which patients. Um, in terms of how the treatments compare with each other, we have few studies and they're mostly underpowered. When you're comparing two active treatments, remember what I was saying about the activity of the comparison group, comparing two good active treatments, you're gonna have a small effect and you need a large, very large sample. In terms of what works for which patients, we have probably everybody in this room has hypotheses about that, but the data are really inconsistent. Initial severity tends to predict, but guess what? Sometimes it predicts better outcome and sometimes it predicts worse outcome, but it tends to predict pretty much one way or the other. <laughs> Something in it for everybody. Um, in terms of comorbidity, there's a lot of thought that people with certain comorbidities can't do this treatment and they can't do that treatment. They're too fragile, they're too this, they're too that. 
And um, what we tend to find is that patients with higher comorbidity are more severe at the outset, they're more severe at the end, but they change the same amount, basically. And so you can do, like, patients who are borderline, I'll show you a slide for patients who have TBI, a lot of comorbidities, <coughs> patients can still do these evidence-based treatments. So this is a comparative effectiveness study um, that just came out comparing prolonged exposure and EMDR. Uh, and uh, this was done in Holland with 155 male and female patients who had serious mental illness. PTSD is a big problem in this patient population. Uh, that that uh, they, they have their serious mental illness, but essentially uh, often because of that, they're exposed to repeated chronic trauma throughout their lives. And so PTSD has been unrecognized for a long time. I think it's getting the traction that it deserves, but we can actually treat the PTSD. And so in this study, they did prolonged exposure with the patients and compared it to EMDR. And the bottom line, I think, is the figure. Both PE and EMDR worked very well. Uh, and, I, and, and this is very encouraging because these are sick patients. You can do these active involved treatments. I'm currently doing a large comparative effectiveness study of prolonged exposure and cognitive processing with Seattle as a site uh, with 900 uh, male and female uh, veterans of all eras. Uh, our main hypothesis is testing the two treatments uh, compared with one another, but we'll be looking at that question of what works for which patients. And in five years, I'll come back and tell you the results. <laughs> uh, treatments such as prolonged exposure and cognitive processing work uh, for uh, veterans of all eras. Uh, I wanted to show this because there's been a lot of thought that the chronic patients won't benefit as much. And in this study, the Vietnam veterans and the uh, returning veterans, uh, OEF, OIF, had better outcomes than Gulf War veterans. So it suggests that the Vietnam veterans certainly were not worse off than the uh, younger uh, veterans. The difference with the Gulf War veterans doesn't necessarily replicate uh, data that come from the VA's program evaluation um, of the, this national training initiative to, to help therapists learn cognitive processing and prolonged exposure. Uh, suggests that uh, patients who receive prolonged exposure uh, benefit regardless of their era. That's the number one takeaway. And um, that in this study, there was a difference of about two and a half points on a scale where five points is a, me a meaningful difference. And so maybe some evidence that, that the younger veterans were better than the Vietnam veterans. So contrary to what I said on the prior slide, I don't think it's a meaningful difference, but in this study, women probably did better than uh, men. So, so the, the takeaway is not these smaller differences, it's the larger differences of overall improvement. And I mentioned, I'm gonna move a little fast so I can take some questions, but I mentioned TBI. You can do cognitive processing therapy and prolonged exposure for TBI. These are meaningful changes. Even moderate and severe TBI can participate. So the last question, and for me, the question where the rubber really hits the road and where we want to be is how we promote recovery and restore quality of life to our patients. First, we have to show that we have effective treatments and they improve their symptoms. But we have to make sure that we really get the patients to where they can go, and recovery should be uh, the goal. Now, when you treat symptoms, functioning and quality of life uh, improve, but sometimes it's important to focus on functioning directly, the areas where people are impaired. And so I mentioned before uh, couples therapy. This is a treatment developed by Candace Munson where she showed that her treatment is not only for couples but any pair, so even a parent-child, uh, two close friends if, if need be. Uh, could participate in uh, the treatment. And what she showed is that PTSD symptoms improved uh, when people received the treatment. She also showed, again, that, that uh, relationship functioning improved, except not according to the, the uh, partners. <laughs> it's kind of like that Viagra study that was first published where they had the self-report. The data were a lot better for the uh, probands than for the partners reporting on the Viagra. <laughs> So, uh, and that isn't why I put this in a blue box, it just dawned on me that. Um, 
it, it's kind of it's it's showing where we want to be or where we're going. That that perhaps for some patients, treating the the PTSD in the context of a dynamic relationship is appropriate. Maybe it's a family. Maybe you really want to treat the PTSD in the context of an intervention focused on work. Uh, it's not clear because sometimes get just treating the PTSD can help, but if you have long-standing functional disabilities, mm -hmm. if I take your PTSD away even in 10 weeks or one week if I do Anka Ehlers treatment, how do you get the skills that you've never learned or that you haven't used in 25 years? There may be a, a, a reason to do, uh, to focus on functioning. My last data slide is simply to say that the benefits of these effective treatments are long-lasting. Follow-up by a work by Patty Resick of a study of female sexual assault survivors who received cognitive processing therapy or prolonged exposure showed that roughly six years after the end of treatment, four out of five of these patients no longer had PTSD. This is very significant. We don't usually do studies with this long-term follow-up, but what it means is that we really can, if we give people the right treatments, we really can get them better. I'm not using CURE yet with uh, capital C, but I think we're moving and we're aiming toward curing PTSD. Do, do you know anything about how long after the, the uh, assault? That sure. Those the question is how long after the assault these patients were. It was around eight years. So wow. they had uh, experienced somewhere, I think on average, six to eight separate viol violent interpersonal events. They had multiple comorbidities. They, they, um, they were, they were tip more typical patients and not pristine. Um, pa they might be your patients. They might be you know, VA patients. So just to wrap up so we have uh, time for questions, the, there, there's really four takeaway points. We have effective psychotherapies for PTSD. It's really, right now, it's individual cognitive behavioral therapy and EMDR that look the most promising. And right now, psychotherapies is more effective than the medications that we have. Uh, medications may be very helpful for some people. Don't count them out. It's just that given what we've got in, in our uh, toolbox, it's the psychotherapy that, that really is the most helpful. Group therapy appears less effective than individual therapy, but remember, we haven't compared them head to head, and group cognitive processing therapy should be put in a separate category. I think it works, and it's, a, it's an effective strategy. And in terms of thinking about the frontier and where we'll be in a few years, the, the research is, is focused on making the treatments that we have better. I fully expect, especially with um, uh, uh, integration with work on biomarkers, which is also a huge and growing area, that we will be able to, to do some things even in three to five years that we can't now in terms of predicting uh, the, the right treatment for a person, predicting who's going to respond and, and, and actually maximizing their outcomes. So I'm gonna say thank you very much and I'll take questions. Um, I just have to remember what I was told about how to put this on the video teleconferencing. So, excuse me, one minute. I think I hit escape. There we are. Okay, good, thank you. So when you're talking about improved symptoms, some of those studies then would have looked at improved uh, sleep. Less yes. interruption of their sleep. Uh, what can you tell us about that? So the question is about, um, given that the studies have showed improved uh, symptoms, what do they say about sleep? Well, uh, sleep is a hard one. And I think that if you think about sleep, are there any sleep researchers or sleep specialists in the room? Oh, good, then I won't be corrected. Um, <laughs> Sleep is a hard one because it, it involves um, such significant biology and habit. And I, t I think what happens is that PTSD may be the initiating factor but not the maintaining factor alone for the sleep disturbance. And so typically we see residual sleep problems even in people who are treated very successfully. And we see it across the various types of psychotherapy. And so, uh, and, and I also think medication studies as, as well. So many people are suggesting that perhaps something like cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia is a nice adjunct uh, because even when their, uh, all their PTSD symptoms get better, they still may have residual sleep problems. But it's hard to use cognitive in the midst of uh, intrusive dreams. 
the, the comment is it's uh, hard to use the cognitive behavioral skills in the midst of intrusive dreams. There are, the CBTI, uh, has anyone in the room been trained in the CBTI? Today? But, but it does help address that. I mean, praise, certainly, I'm in Praises in land, and Praises in, I think, um, certainly can help with, with the nightmares. But the psychotherapy can help. And the nice thing about the psychotherapy, I'm all for it because it teaches skills. It fixes the problem rather than just manages the problem. But right now, uh, simply, um, the, the psychotherapies don't sufficiently uh, move the needle on sleep in the way that they do on many other domains. Yes. I have a question remotely. Uh, the question is why hasn't VA rolled out EMDR training as an EBT? Um, VA has an evidence, uh, I, I'm not speaking for the VA, meanwhile, so sort of this is my opinion, but to the best that I, I know. Um, we have a, a rollout of evidence-based psychotherapies, and at the time this was launched, the evidence base was, and I think still is stronger for the two that got picked. First was cognitive processing, and then a year later, prolonged exposure. Uh, many VAs offer EMDR, but my guess is that it's, it's, it's resource limitations bec because we can't simply do uh, everything. There was a question in the back. On the inpatient unit, we have relatively few uh, very brief psychotherapy things we can do, motivation interviewing, brief skills training. Is there anything in PTSD that's been found to be efficacious you know, in one or two sessions? To, there have been, um, in my view, uh, unrealistic reports of people getting better in one or two sessions. Uh, I don't believe there's anything you can do in one or two sessions that will help the person, but you can help get the person set up for something that might work. So in an inpatient setting, you might get them engaged with, um, with motivational interviewing to actually get um, involved in a psychotherapy. You could also help them um, with online uh, supports that may be helpful. We have an, if I were able to show my last slide, a PTSD coach is an app that we have for symptom management. We have an online portal that's more extensive called PTSD Coach Online. But I, th I think that helping the people get open to treatment and get engaged in care and find it using the, the, the freely available tools is probably the best uh, you can do. If there's people in the room who disagree with me, you can say so, but I just don't see, if you, if you got one to two sessions, uh, we don't have a therapy for that yet. Brad, you had a question? Yeah, thanks Paula, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful lecture. You know, I, I'm very interested in measuring functionality and, and I understand the importance of symptom reduction and monitoring symptoms. I'm not always convinced that symptoms and functions do move um, together. You touched a little bit at the end of your talk on functionality versus symptoms. Can you expand on that a little bit? Sure. Um, th this actually is a, an, a research interest of mine, and I, I base that on some data that we have in particular where where we looked at both synchronous change and lagged change. Because all the time I hear clinicians saying, the symptoms improve, but the functioning doesn't improve until down the road. Okay, so we tested that using uh, a structural equation framework. So we could test, does change correlate with change, or is uh, initial change required, does the initial change uh, in symptoms predict the later change in functioning? And essentially, in our data, it was all synchronous. So the, the initial change was not predicting further change. Now, I know that is not true for some people because they get the symptoms down and then they start doing things in life that they haven't done before. They make friends again, they start dating, they get a job and such. So I know my data are wrong at some level, but a lot of the, the over, at least the self-reported functioning tends to track with the symptoms themselves, which is why I think we have to do better at getting the, the self-reported functioning even better uh, one other thing I just want to say on this, you didn't ask me, but I think we don't often ask enough about satisfaction and happiness and kind of a new attitude on life, and I think that's also what people see when they think a patient is better. And even I thought myself in my own studies have not been measuring the extent to which after treatment I have a different <coughs> view on life. And I think that life satisfaction pro should be added to uh, more studies to capture uh, uh, to capture that additional piece of change.
Well, I'm sorry, I talked as fast as I could to try to get us through on time because I think you're busy clinicians. Um, so I'll say thank you very much and um, I welcome, anybody can contact me for slides or questions or anything that, that, that follows. Thank you.